हाँ गो लाइव करा गो लाइव करके सबको सेंड करो हाँ सेट करो सर क्या आ, आ क्या रहा है ये थोड़ी देर में आएगा क्या ये बस तीस एफ पी एस पे है बस और कोई दिक्कत थर्टी एफ पी एस है ना थर्टी एफ पी एस पे रहे और ये टू सिक्स के बी पी एस पर है स्टार्ट हो गया लाइव हो गया है लाइव नहीं नहीं यही थे हाँ भूपा ने बुलाया जब आएंगे ना करते हैं तब स्टार्ट करना सामने देखो सामने थोड़ा हंसते भी रहो बस तो यू आर एल तो यही रहा ना स्ट्रीमिंग यू आर एल ये रहता स्ट्रीमिंग यू आर एल तो ये रहता बता भेजना है ना अरे कर देंगे हेलो नमस्ते बताओ नहीं हो जाएगा लेकिन भाई एक घंटा देना पड़ेगा क्योंकि अभी हम डेक्स पे हैं नहीं हाँ ठीक कल हमको एक दिन सुबह कल हमको एक दिन याद दिला देना ठीक है ना हमें याद दिला देना हम कर देंगे हो जाएगा
आ रहे हो पे पे देखिए अभी नहीं आन ट्रांसपोर्ट ये ट्रांसपोर्ट बुक में था उसमें क्लिक करेंगे तो नंबर मिल तो उधर बात करके हम पीछे बैठे हैं वो उठा के और हम रिकॉर्डिंग कर रहे हैं हम आप अगर ओके करेंगे तो फिर हम आप उसको हर दिन को देना है नहीं हम वो हमारे पास पहुंचवा दे रहा है इसको वो वो उसमें है तो ना आप ये तो सही बता दें आप हमसे हम कराने के लिए अभी आप देख उसको दे सुरेश आपका कोई को भी भेज दीजिए एम वी अरविंद वाले को दे देगा थैंक यू क्या करना है भाई हो गया ना रहा
Good evening to all. Uh, I welcome you on the next uh, Institute Lecture Series. And to start the program, I would like to invite Honorable Director uh, Professor Yenji Shina and respected guest uh, Professor Paramjit Singhjal to come on the dais and like the dais. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Honorable 
faculty colleagues, members of the staff, and my dear students. Uh, for today's edition of Institute Lecture Series, we have with us the presence of Professor T. F. Jaj. Professor Paranjit Singh Jaj is a professor of sociology at Guru Nanak Dev University. In his tenure at the university, Professor Jaj has served as Dean at Admin Affairs and Pro Vice Chancellor. In his distinguished career, Professor Jaj has received numerous awards and recognitions. Lately, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, National Fellowship for Social Justice, 2013 14. Faculty Enrichment and Research Fellowship of Shastri Indo Canadian Institute, New Delhi, 1991 and 1998. British Commonwealth Fellowship at Royal Institute of Public Administration, London, 1987. He has served as a visiting fellow at the University of Jammu, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Mumbai University, Pune University, and Delhi School of Economics. Additionally, he has served as a member of UGC and ICSSR expert committees for the evaluation of major and minor projects. To his credit, Dr. Sajaj has 22 books, 73 research articles, and 49 book reviews. He is currently serving as the president of Indian Sociological Society and is the editor of prestigious research journal, Sociological Bulletin. Once again, sir, I welcome you on behalf of the Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Now, I will speak to the Professor A.S. Nisita, the director of the institute, faculty members, and my dear students. Let me tell you, I have not been a science student. And uh, if I did science education as a student, it was as old as 1973. And what I am going to speak on is based on my interest in science. Because I always think that to understand social sciences, it's very important that you make sense of what is science and what is sociology, and then you come to social sciences. I, I, I would like to come like this, not talking about much. But if you want to understand science, it is not my purpose to explain what science is as such, but I want to talk about. What is the fundamental premise on which science is based? <laughs> to understand what is the fundamental premise of science, I will take up history. And I will not take much time on talking about history. And I think the thing which I am going to say, most of you know it. The only thing I will do is that I will make some chronological ordering of the things to tell, say what I want to say about science. So much technology is concerned, technology is not science. It is not inseparably related to the science historically. Even at the time of Greece, Greece the distinction was made between episteme and technique. Episteme was knowledge, whereas technique was the art skills and other things. Even in Indian tradition, we had Brahmins dealing with Episteme, there are art reasons dealing with technology. And in India, in most of the places during the earlier times, the people who were dealing with technology, they did not have any high status in society. But now it's a different thing. So, therefore, <laughs> over a period of time, we have started perceiving that science and technology are one and the same thing. Whereas, Science does not make a question, it discovers, whereas technology is based on innovation. Innovation is done on the, base, on the basis of a kind of element, but we call it communication. But let me first start with science, because science is something uh, which uh, is more important for making sense of the Science has come out of curiosity 
to understand the external world. And the external world has its stages of understanding. That how human mind was perceiving this external world. So the first thing which people were seeing, everybody was watching, every night for the sun, for the stars and moon, and in the day time. So they always had a question, where are we? And what is this? This also had something to do with the earlier interpretations, which were essentially based on this, that it was God which created the entire universe, which created this world, and different mythology have different explanations. And in one way or the other, when Greek science came, that was came for change, but at the same time, there was one view which was never changed <coughs> till the coming of the 16th century. And that view was that the universe has been so created that Earth is the center of the entire universe. We can really call it Earth's centric view of this. And this nice value in West. So in West it was Christian domination, and that was the time when Roman Catholicism was dominating. It so happened that uh, people started realizing that if we started to pick up calculations, if we started to explain, and if we assume that art is the center of the universe, there are many things which cannot be explained, but nobody has the public credit to say that art is not the center of our universe. At that time, the notion of the universe was also limited. And then came a Christian monk, a Polish, or a priest, but he wrote it, but he could not publish it because he feared persecution by the Roman Catholic establishment. Just when he knew that he was about to die, his book was published, his name was Robert Nicholas, and then he came on with his theory. It was largely known to find this, that art is not the center. If we have to understand this standard world, has to be heliocentric view, which we call sun is the center of all things. If you make sun as the center of the entire uh, this thing, then it would become possible to make sense of the whole thing. So, and then obviously, uh, after moving around sun, all those explanations were offered by him. We call it Copernican So, this was the first evolution of its kind in the history of science. And one thing which this particular view did was that it seriously confronted the Roman Catholicism, the established religion. So it was a very, very serious kind of thing. Uh, if I'm not wrong, you will know it is better. In the list of books, Popper Nicholas's book, his book is still better book. But that has not happened. But in the 60th century, there was another thing which happened, which was very, very important. Reformation took place. That large number of countries moved away from the Roman Catholic religion, and we had the birth of Protestant religion. So, but once they moved from the Protestant religion, they could not use religion to control people. And in order to control people, they started giving them more freedom. And this right of this, in most of the Protestant countries, the free inquiry, the development of science started developing at a different pace. So once you explain this entire astronomical universe in one go, I am not saying things can stop there, but that was the first transmitted transformation. We have capital radio in between the, the uh, in between. But then the second issue which was very important was that what is the behavior of these physical objects or the physical world behaves? But why the particular stars, moon, sun, they are moving or how they are following or particular of this thing? So this particular aspect was something and how they were rotating together. So that's what we call it in the 17th century, the Newtonian Revolution. The Newtonian evolution, most of you know the three laws of Newton, and you also know the law of gravitation. And for the first time, it was Newton's law of inertia which explained that things could not change their state of motion and inertia unless they 
sense and it's other forces applied. This was one of the very important kind of law. And the second, obviously I am not talk about the two, but then I have talked about the gravitational. Gravitational law again explained that why the two objects are holding together and how they are attracted to each other. That also back to say that why the objects fall on us. That was with the revolution which was taking place. And uh, once this physical part was explained in terms of its state, then the universe of the composition of this physical world. That was the world of mystery. And then we entered the 19th century. In the 19th century, sorry, 18th century. In the 18th century, there was a widely held view that matter is destructive. This was one. And the second which was very important was that there is a particular element in all the other objects or elements which is highly inflammable. It was not protesty. And uh, so that's why those particular objects or the elements which have large amount of electricity they burn quickly and those who do not have electricity, they do not burn. So you could burn put their iron with wood uh, and so on and so forth. So this was an established fact. But then, <coughs> that was also the time when oxygen was not discovered. We know so everybody was incidentally, two people came up with the discovery of oxygen. David Priestley and Rawalsi. But I will focus on Rawalsi. Rawalsi's law book is available to the people who would like to do study of this. And Rawalsi is the only scientist in the history who knew that what he was writing is a revolution in science. We don't have any other example of this kind of a thing. So what happens? Then he said that matter is not indestructible. This was his first time. And then he said there was there is no such thing like electricity in any of the objects. He said that when it burns, and if you take that entire smoke which is coming out of it and the residue which is available, and if you weigh all the things, you will find that the weight is more than the actual object has to hold it. Of that object. So he said that there is some gas in the atmosphere that we know of oxygen which makes certain components, which makes certain other uh, chemicals as a threat of which you know the nature changes. So out of that he started working on that if oxygen is doing it, then it would be sign, say, sign, all those things we start working on. This was a major transformation in the sense that uh, the, our whole mystery in fact developed well from what there was in it. So if you look at this order from the astronomical world to the physical world to the physical composition which we call it mystery, then there was one thing left that was how this entire world has come to be on this side. So it is here that there were large number of leaves. And we know that virtually all the religious traditions and the great thinkers within those religious traditions have tried to make sense of that. We also know that most of the bus and the creator in certain ways is a real tradition in this. But I will not because it will take 40 minutes for me to explain how it was. But even we know that uh, uh, even Christian mythology has saved that seven days that life was created towards the end and man was particularly created. All these things we all know that these are our uh, religious beliefs. We still sometimes believe that this is all that happened. So therefore, the moment we started taking off, all life evolved on earth. In fact, the word, it is very difficult to say war. But the moment I say war, it is assumed that it is an evolution. So nobody would have argued about that or the war. 
life of the Lord of God. But it requires that how we have so many uh, animals, insects, plants, and all those things, how they have come, all the way have come to this. If God has not created, why we have so diversity? Because we know that religious tradition also think about the miracles, mystery, and other things of God in relation to the action of God. Sorry, acts of God. But so what happens is that the first person who systematically articulated the idea that perhaps the life has evolved or not was Lema. And he did it towards the end of uh, uh, he, in fact, we can say that towards the end of 18th century to the beginning of 19th century, he was a naturalist, philosopher, physiologist. And he has tremendously contributed to the history of ideas. But this was one on which uh, people started talking at. Because we should know that any scientific discovery, discovery, one thing is very important, the other should accept it. If the others don't accept it, then it is, it is no discovery. We also have a history of some of the great minds who committed suicide because what they discovered was fast breaking, but nobody could find it at that time. Oh. <coughs> so he went into that accident and he lost his leg and people started saying that look oh, here, he has lost his leg. So when he talks about rules and issues of organs, he gave the example of giraffe, how it was it might be uh, there was need to have food kind of a thing. So therefore, people started arguing that if the evolution has to take place, if the use and issues of organs, then the descendants of Lamarck would have only one leg. Because he lost his leg, he's using only one leg. If he died as a very disappointed man. But then, again, something interesting happened. In the second retreat of 19th century, there was a priest. And this priest was uh, wrote a book, and the book was Essays on Proposition. And in this particular book, he argued that on earth, the species multiply geometrically. And uh, whereas the social on earth, they agree arithmetically. Yes, you are all the day students, I think not to say what is the difference between the two species. <coughs> And so he said that there is always a gap between the sources available and the number of species dependent upon, upon those that particular source. So he then said that therefore, large number of species disappear because of the shortage of resources. And he said wars among humans, epidemics, they are good for maintaining population so that there is no overburden. So when he wrote this, he wrote this it was a big book. But this was one which caught the eye of scientists. And it is here that Darwin started his whole idea of evolution. It was another person by the name of Wallace, uh, kind of a thing. And then he read a paper, he developed his theory in which he started talking about natural selection. And he gave a elaborate discussion. Uh, uh, explanation to that all life would have more on earth, all species might have come up. Then he give some illustrations that all this happens. But now they just that. Yeah. One of the famous quotations uh, which generally I use is that uh, the species which are very strong or weak, uh, none of them survive. Only those species survive which adapt to the changing environment or the, or the physical environment. So this was one major thing that is that, that how with all the, the, the evolution might have taken place. But there were many things that this theory did not explain. When he wrote his original species, which came up either in 1857 or 1859, you can on the suggestion of John, that virus, I think John does somebody, he put survival of the fittest. He so was talking about natural selection, but then he put survival of the fittest. This word survival of the fittest was not the innovation of either Darwin 
or Paris. If Dave Brown is a sociologist by the name of Herbert Spencer, who wrote uh, Principles of Sociology, it has to probably come there, he was already acting in art. So something which was happening between disciplines and then in Salon Tuesday. But it was something which was not acceptable. But by the time Darwin becomes the major figure, and we know in those pieces one of the greatest works in the history of science, there was another monk in Scandinavian countries. He was working on a plant called uh, Poroplog, and he would take uh, their seeds and then grow them, separate them, and kind of thing. And uh, in 1860, 1863, he published an article that how heredity works in terms of size of the uh, plant, in terms of nature of the color of the flower and all that. He, he gave idea of uh, segregation, idea of independent assortment. It was very elaborated. And nobody noticed him. And he died as a disappointed man in 1900. In 1900, a serious critical evaluation of Darwin was done. One of the illustrations introduced was that we say that if a new organ of the species one, that if that organ has to be useful, then one of the conditions is that this new species should have fully developed that kind of organ. For example, if you take oxygen and when the species one started evolving, we have a very small range of uh, of the vision, and when it cannot fly, if it cannot fly, then this particular small organ is of no use. So the argument was that it is only possible to have a useful organ working if it is fully developed. It gave rise to the idea of rotations. So you would use these then. You know, give this idea of mutations, then we have then obviously Mendel was recognized and now we call him father of heredity. I will not go beyond 1900 because I will keep on talking about what we call it 20th century and other, but that is not what I want to say. This is the data I have given to you. So, can you think of on the basis of this? But what essentially is this essence of science? This is something we have to know. That what science, what is the fundamental principle of science is based? So it is here that the philosophy of science comes into picture. And there is a beautiful book written by Karl Popper, which is called Logic of Science. In this book, he says, that the essence of science is the principle of falsification. He says that whatever the law, whatever the discovery which a scientist makes, he frames it in such a way so that it can be falsified. This is something which is very, very important when we look at science. That falsifiability is important. He gives simple illustration. He says that that suppose we, let us say, we go to the Himalayas and we see white swans and then we come back and we say all swans are white. And when he said this, nobody had discovered black swans. Later on in this area they were discovered. He said that if there is one black swan, then the entire assertion that all swans are white is wrong. So science will never state that this is the final thing. I would say under these conditions, for example, I, I always give this example, that all of you have studied this, what we call it Galton's hypothesis. Now what is Galton's hypothesis? Galton's hypothesis says that under these similar conditions of temperature and pressure, equal volumes of all gases contain equal number of atoms. So oh, this is a simple letter than hypothesis. We still call it letter than hypothesis. A friend of mine told me that this is also a letter by the name of letter than hypothesis. I don't know. So, <clears throat> if you look at this particular hypothesis, 
process, it has a very interesting quality. And the quality is that it can be verified. So immediately people start working on, uh, on this particular hypothesis that they found that if we have gases which are compound, then how do you, we can talk about atoms? For example, you have hydrochloric of gas, which means that one uh, one hydrochloric hydrochloric gas would consist of half hydrochloric hydrogen, half hydrochloric chlorine. Now this is not possible because atom is the indivisible smallest part of an element. So therefore, this formulation is wrong. Then I will get to argue that it is not atoms, it is equal volume of molecular gases with a equal number of molecules. This is not the one example. Let us come to 27, just for me to last statement. Oh, this was the man who got Nobel Prize last year in history, or physics, whatever, it is covered in both. This we call it Schrodinger's wave equation. All the uh, students at, at certain levels might have studied Schrodinger's wave equation. Schrodinger's wave equation says that the electron has a wave vector. But most of the students of science don't know that when Schrodinger made this discovery, then there was a serious controversy in the philosophy of science. Because that was the time that a virtual war was going on between two schools of thought in philosophy. One was materialist and the other was idealist. Most of the idealists believed that idea is something which has its own existence and it emerges. Whereas materialists say that without material tradition at that stage you cannot have ideas, all these things. So when Schrodinger came out with this argument that electron has a wave equation, then the idealist said that no materialism is finished. And to the extent that some of the world leaders also contributed to that, they said okay, then some people said that no, it is not like this. In fact, our understanding of material conditions and matter, physical matter, has become better. But later on, we discovered that Schrodinger's wave equation as a problem of what we call it uncertainty. You know, it's something very interesting that uh, the thing is moving. At one point of time, you can either have its speed or its condition. And uh, you cannot have simultaneously two. But the moment they started assuming that it has a wave equation, certain problems came in in the behavior of electron. So, therefore, finally, it returned to that electron has both wave and matter. It is that has both combination of that. So this is what we call it, the nature of science, that whatever we do, we can refute it and we can have new discovery or new arguments on this basis. This is something which we have to remember. Uh, one of the main other problems with science is that science basically questions our fundamental belief. It questions the way we look at the world, the way we have been socialized to believe. So therefore, if we seriously understand that how the world has happened, science has always been, uh, you know, under suspicion. Because they think that some of the issues which we have in our social life will be questioned. On the other hand, the pathology is widely accepted by every kind of people. Now, where is this uh, Osama bin Laden? Who, who was, you know, pathologist, but he used, you know, the pathology. We have Palestinian terrorists, they use the pathology. There they did not use scores and traditional methods of war. So technology is acceptable because it creates conveniences. But technology also has its side. Technology may also lead to gas tempers. But anyway, now let me come to social sciences. So whenever we start with social sciences, let us be very clear that social sciences make hypotheses, but those hypotheses 
very, very valuable or falsifiable, but they are not permanently refuted. That's one of the very serious aspects of uh, social sciences. Why? Now, whether you have technology, you have to work for so many dimensions in terms of science. So we have a large number of concepts of science, starting from what is velocity, what is viscosity, what is elasticity, and a number of concepts. And these concepts have been agreed upon. In the sense that we agree that these are the definitions. This is why. Second is that science and technology are developing so fast that once they fail, most of the students of science tend to forget what was earlier. And in fact, from Harvard, uh, the, the person was a Harvard University professor. He has written a large number of science fiction. And his name was Asimov, the first name you can find out. In one of his stories, he tells that there was a star, star ship, whatever it is used in the Twitter, star trek ship, which went to one another earth and it found oxygen. But when the people stayed there, they all died. 30, 40 years back, uh, a little later, they again went to that particular place, but this time, they have different kind of equilibrium. And then there was a person who had tremendous uh, ability to memorize everything. He could read and memorize, remember it. They took him with him. So when this particular group went there, they found that, you know, there are a large number of guests in the atmosphere, they identified the gases. This person who had such a memory finds that there is this particular gas. So he you know, tell us the crew that don't, don't stay there to be right. They come to the ship and throw them. Then there is a court marshal against him. And the court marshal is asked that why did you, you know, provoke this, this kind of a court from the crew? He said, I wanted to save your life. He said, why, you know, you wanted to know why those people died? So yes. He said, do you remember that in 1920, this particular gas was discovered to be clear in the atmosphere. And it is very clearly stated that if humans inhale this gas, they will die. It doesn't, it is not important that it should be a very high, you know, quantity, even small, smallest and part of it, if they inhale, they will die. I mean, this is all that happens, that we tend to forget what earlier discoveries were and how this happened. So therefore, most of the development in science and the science in science and technology is what is happening at the present. And science has an agreement with the concepts. All concepts are accepted. The 20th century greatest uh, philosopher after Russell, which not probably Russell science, he said that all the propositions of science are true propositions in their own way. Uh, but in social sciences it is not like this. In this way, for example, I give you the simple example of democracy. Is there one definition of democracy? There is not one democracy. You will find there are 20 definitions of democracy and 20, 30 stories of democracy. And every category of people would claim that what they are practicing is too democratic. When all this controversy was going on, Chinese came up with uh, this argument that we are too democratic. <coughs> and uh, don't think that if there are two parties, they are competing with each other and one is elected, here sometimes the other is elected, that's why they would be a democracy. What is a democracy? So what happens is one thing. That whether you have a concept or you have a theory, they will come. In the 19th, from the 19th century to 21st century, we have a large number of theories in social sciences. And we cannot say 
that they have been recruited. I give you the example uh, which is very popular uh, this century. That was in 1990 when perhaps the Soviet Union, you may be knowing that uh, uh, before 1990 there was a country, state called Soviet Union, USSR, Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. And it collapsed in 1990. And when it collapsed, then new countries of ours and status. And new, a new kind of thing happened. And so, therefore, maybe you may not be remembering that this kind of thing also happened. So, the moment this happened, class, so obviously people started talking about that Marxism is dead. All the theories which Karl Marx wrote are dead. And it has become irrelevant. From 1990 onwards, people started arguing about it. But in 2009, we had a serious economic crisis in the Western world. The India was first state government, no doubt about it. But it was not that serious, we say. Then you know, a person by the name of Thomas Piketty came with a book, Capitalism in 21st Century, and whole Marxism in the the West. This is one thing which is very, very important in the case of social sciences. Now, what is this? That, that we do not agree upon concepts and we do not have theories with time. So, this is a term which is used. And the term is that social sciences have essentially contested concepts. That whatever concept you have, there is always another term. So once you have this, then the work of a social scientist changes dramatically. And he says that the social scientist has to kind of read, do everything. That uh, uh, this is how it happens, that uh, what was 19th right century, what is 20th century. And there is a third thing, which is important. We think that science, they predict, it can predict. There is a prediction that scientists would say that, uh, for example, you know, the technology has become so good that now we know what will be the weather for the next week, you know, for two weeks, three weeks, we know the weather and accordingly we plan it. This is the technological advancement which has taken place. Similarly, science would, would do it. Carl Lampton, the contemporary of Newton, Arthur Henry, uh, he uh, discovered that uh, a particular comet appears after every 39 years or 59 years and he predicted that it would appear again in this particular year and it predicted him and then it was named and his comet. So that kind of thing is possible in science that you can predict that this is how it will happen. But at the same time, if it does not happen, perhaps science is capable of explaining why it did not happen. But there is a problem in social sciences. <coughs> that is the fundamental issue. That if you look at science and technology, we do, these are two similar two areas of knowledge. They deal with the inanimate world. In the sense that Science deals with physical world, chemical world, or the biological world, biological that is life process, or astronomical world. All these things have no consciousness. In the sense that they, their behavior is uh, predictable because by the way it, it, it repeats and the way it keeps on happening. But if you look at social societies, there is a one problem. Problem is that all of you, many of you, might be going together five six shop and you can want to bring groundnuts from a shop, give them and contribute some money and say, hey, hopefully they are kind of thing. And he goes, and then it is quite possible for you to think that 
give a lead of the way or give a lead of the way and you will also run out of the bus. This is one. And second thing is that if you read newspapers, you may not necessarily believe that whatever is written is true. And if somebody tells you this has happened, you may not believe the person. Why? Because we think that the person can tell a lie. Even in the non-human objects, there is a great degree of prediction. Take example of honeybees. We all consume honey. Honeybees, you know all these insects, this uh, etymology deals with insects. Insects have a particular way of reproduction, particularly in certain cases. Now among the honeybees, we have mother bee, and then we have soldiers, we have workers, we have spouse. These are the three components. Uh, for the reproduction of the species, mother uh, reproduces at a particular point of time. So whenever they have to search for nectar, it is the spouse which go and try to find out where nectar is available. So they go there and they get come back. What is their method of communication? Someday entomologists will to back it out. But it has never happened that what the spouse have told or communicated to, let us say not to the word told, communicated to the workers, the honey was not there. Honey would always be there. Honey would always be there. But in the case of human beings, you cannot say that a person here is telling the truth. That is one of the problems. So we ask, what is the evidence that this has happened? That is, that is something very important. And the moment we started asking this question that I don't believe you, just this particular word, I don't believe you, which means that we are dealing with, with the subjects who can, whose behavior cannot be protected. Now, with the same kind of stimulus, you say, you abuse the person with the same, something like abuse, everybody would have been right. So therefore, the moment we deal with you, that's why the politics is so unpredictable, because it deals with the behavior of human beings. That's why all marriages do not survive, you know, some marriages survive, some marriages do not survive. We talk about that we do not complement each other, we don't have the same kind of this thing. And nobody else can say whether it is love marriage or engaged marriage, that it will survive, but uh, divorce will not take place or some problem will not come. Why? Because we think we have a personality, we have this kind of life, and we, we are doing it in the kind of a thing. Then we lose the word ego. That there is an ego, self respect. <coughs> All these things we use. So, therefore, when we deal with such kind of a subject, where the object of study, they have such consciousness that they can say anything. I remember once an American anthropologist went to a village and uh, he asked, Where would you cook your food? You know, uh, there is much a drain pipe from the rooftop. We all water put upon it. He said, I have been cooking the food here. Now, he said, You cannot cook your food. So I know we cook the food here. What will you say? People at once, an anthropologist came, he had his own experience. And uh, Every day, you know, we didn't have this much barren mission then, or we didn't have Vatalias. So people used to go out, but to us the call of nature. And most of the cases, I, I don't know whether you, you, know, you know the line, we used to have a particular dato, we used to call it, was a particular plant called Hesia. Hikar, Kabul, people will cut it. Do it as Puritana. And she noted that in this village, in this village, all the people take breakfast of a particular wood and eat it. And if we go from 
North India, take about 100 years early, we go to Sweden. We have only one month of sunshine is available or two months. So people go to the sea. They sleep there and they take a bath, they throw water for each other, and then again they burgers, eat and then relax. So we can very well say that these people are the worshippers of sun. They close their eyes and do something in their mind, then they throw water at the sun by each other and then they eat the star of bread. It is perfectly explainable. So we are culturally different. So I am coming from Bhameshwar. I came from Punjab, went to Bhameshwar, and I have come to that Lucknow. Lucknow is culturally close to Punjab and Lucknow, but still, the food is different. The food is different. That's why Indian science said that mathematics also has a social nature. He said uh, that is both mountain. I tell that you go out from one. Uh, I have counted from one, two, three, four, five, six, up to hundred. I counted. Then I tell the other that I have counted up to hundred. You counted beyond hundred. When I come back, I found that he is not counted one hundred, one hundred, two, one hundred, three, but he is counting one hundred two, one hundred four, one hundred eight, one hundred six, one hundred eight. And so I look back out there and he asked him, why did you do it? He said, this is how it is done. We do it like this. So instead of counting, just counting, take the count, take counting of some objects. So it is because of this that in social sciences, the task of prediction, the task of giving final explanation on the basis of which you can make wrong is very difficult. I have a classical example of a man, he said the lectures of Ram People start realizing that the BJP government will disappear. And you, we nobody knew that anybody party would come. It did not happen. So people could not think about it except some, but everybody thought that they are just trying to please the government. Otherwise, this is not going to happen. People believe this. People thought about it. And uh, so what happens is that it is because of this that social sciences are a little difficult in different contexts. It requires tremendous accumulation of knowledge of the part of social sciences. What, what are the theories, what had happened, the knowledge of history to work on the contemporary. And that is something which is important. So we should remember I, I am say the final words, then I will stop. In 1958 or so, two German philosophers wrote a book. Uh, their name was Horkheimer and Adorno. And the title of the book was Dialectics of the Enlightenment. This particular book was based on the argument that how instrumental rationality in Europe has become the reason for the destruction of Europe in the Second World War. So, enlightenment was the period where for the first time rationality, reason was at hand. And the people claimed that we can know everything. And everything is knowable, but is unknown will become unknowable and then perhaps knowable, all those things. So the best way to do it is to develop reason. This is another thing which the enlightenment philosopher said that it is possible for us to change societies. You know, it is like a good computer mouse that you want to draw something, you move to the house and you can draw it. So the idea of society to change was like, you know, working on computer and drawing a particular kind of, you know, uh, design. But uh, what happened? You all followed it. They followed this rationality, scientific rationality. And what did all do? Follow. They said it, they got follow us. And uh, we had best time 
Yes. In Nazi Germany, where millions of Jews were killed uh, through those gas chambers. So he said that when you look at the enlightened way, on the one hand, science has given us so much, technology has given us so much, but at the same time, it also has at the human cost. Now look at you. The same science and technology is destroying our environment. When I was young, small kid, I belonged to the area where we have a lot of seasonal breaks. So we will just take, take the sand and there will be water and we will drink the water. Now when I see a tap and try, I cannot take water from a tap. Water comes in water. Water comes in water because our body is polluted. Who is polluted it? In Punjab, you know who polluted water? Us. This Shaujalya uh, movement. Everywhere these uh, toilets were flushed, toilets were open, and instead of treating the underground water, the emissions, they just were so drawn that it would be stored by that. It contaminated the whole underground water. Technology tells us that whatever we have at the time, it gets absorbed into surface water. So, surface water, they store what it happens. But no, what we are having by way of this. And the greed uh, is so much that even the parks, the open spaces have been, you know, grossed by the real estate developers. And uh, and today it, it, it becomes so quickly that is the ability of the economy. I think that is why we always say that humanity is a problem and we should also understand how historically mankind has evolved and what are its consequences of science, technology, or society. If science has consequences for, for religions, and if technology has consequences for our environment, we have to do what the take that case. I was just talking about, you know, I am a professor, very senior professor now about to leave the university. Once I am going to my department, two young boys, one boy and one girl, very good to be handsome. They were coming together and climbing stairs along with me, just behind me. And they had this hope and they were doing this and when they reached my door, I found them. I said, look here, both of you are smart and excellent. You don't enjoy each other's company? Why don't you talk to each other and enjoy it? But why are you looking at your phone number? You have all the time on the water to see it. I see young boys and girls there just running with earphones. <laughs> and they are uh, you know, either talking or uh, listening to music. And that is how it is happening. So, it is here that social science is a very, very important. Uh, left to itself, as you know, uh, I give you a bad example that I saw. One of the greatest experts of warfare uh, was from Germany. Uh, I have not my memory is I have spoken on war. Two days back I have to him. He said, war is too serious a matter to hand it over to our generals. It should be controlled by the by the politicians and society. Similarly, science and technology, particularly technology, is too serious to be exclusively left to the corporate sector and engineers. It has to be controlled by the conscience of the society. Thank you.
philosophy of science, history of science, and then connecting this science with science and technology, humanities, social and social science. We feel that the student of engineering and technology, all the students, because we, we have to work in society, we have to live in society, so knowledge of uh, social sciences are important. Two things surprised me. First thing was that I was thinking that you will talk on something more on sociology, but it was history of science. Uh, we are thankful. The second thing, uh, when we are trying to have your lecture, trying to arrange your lecture, we were afraid that the students will not be large in number. Because uh, Rakesh Kumar told me that today the students are not going to be able to get their grade in class. So, so when I say, let us try. So, even if they have their year four on the year, uh, but still we are proud. We think a large number of students, uh, they have proved us wrong. Still we are happy. And this tells us the success of the Institute Lecture Series. And thank you very much. And now, if you have any questions, any queries, you are welcome to our office. It's already five, over five. So, uh, Professor is here. Uh, he is here tomorrow morning. So, you have plenty of time. You have any curiosity about the role of humanity in science and technology, you are welcome to come to the guest house and we shall see the professor. I can thank you all. I thank the professor for coming, taking trouble to come into this remote place of class. But it is a remote place, but it is a good place. Uh, I always tell that the student has first of all, if you have a chance to take it. Again, I request our honorable director to present this song and welcome to